Steve, when you said you're going to bring me to the bottom, you you weren't kidding where you were at the bottom, aren't we? Yeah, we're down here 4,000 feet below the rim of the Grand Canyon. So where are we and what are we looking at? So we're in this uh, big side canyon to the, the main Grand Canyon, and we're looking at the granite basement rock, which is the, the core of the continent, if you will. And then we see the flat-lying strata on top of it. and. Uh, Boy, it's uh, an abrupt boundary, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. It's a, it's a surface. It's not a three-dimensional object. It's a two-dimensional surface that we're looking at right here. So we have this very s clear, solid, almost purple-looking uh, foundation. It's here. a granite it's a rock, granite. Uh -huh. and the granite rock is overlain by sandstone, quartz and feldspar sand grains inside of the, the Tapete sandstone lay directly on that granite. Why, why does it appear to be such a, a stark line? I mean, it's clear. I think it's an erosional boundary of colossal scale. We're looking at something that shows the magnitude of flood flow over a surface. Granite was pulverized and converted to sand, and we see the rock above. That's the Tapete sandstone. The boundary, the two-dimensional boundary between the granite rock below and the Tapete sandstone above is this surface we call the Great Unconformity. And is it just here? The Great Unconformity is continent-wide. It may be intercontinental. It, I've seen it, I believe, in the Middle East. It's over in Europe. Uh, it's in Africa, and here it is uh, under the North American continent. Mm -hmm. We see the core of the continent, the granite core, and then we see the, the stratified, layered rock on top. It uh, shows evidence of milling, of mechanical erosion, of pulverization of the grains at, above. At the boundary? At the boundary. And so it's a, uh, it, it is flowing water uh, with a vengeance, a fury of flow over this surface, ripped and pulverized the surface and created uh, the sandstone overlying it. So let me see if I can get the, the picture here. The, the granite that we're looking at was bigger than this and uh, the top portions are being crumbled and torn apart, but eventually at some point it sheared off. It, it continually sheared off for some reason to this level and then it stopped mm -hmm. being pulverized and then finally uh, we're, we're making a, a deposit on top. And the particles uh, that form the layers above, wh where do they come from? Uh, they're milled from underneath okay. or come from a distance, uh -huh. probably both. Uh, there's particles that are being uh, pulverized as the water's going over the top of them, and then there's particles being swept in from distance. Okay. We can see the evidence of the current in the, in the bedding layers, and uh, it's a powerful current moving at several feet per second, you know, something like that to make these sand grains move. It's uh, water power well displayed. Yeah, so when you told me you were gonna show me uh, where the power of water can really be seen, this is really it, isn't it? This is one of the big ones, isn't it? So we've got this uh, layer. How thick is this layer? What goes up from here? We, we have uh, Tapete sandstone, 350 feet thick here. And then above that, we have the first shale layer, the Bright Angel Shale, and above that, the Muav formation. And that forms what's called the Sauk Sequence. And the Sauk Sequence is this package of strata here in the Grand Canyon that continues all the way across North America. Uh, I've seen it in Nevada, in Utah, in Colorado. It goes underground in uh, Nebraska. It's in Illinois, Ohio, and uh, Pennsylvania and New York. It goes across the continent. And this unconformity, the great unconformity, sits underneath that package of strata. It makes one uh, really question the notion of a small local flood. We're talking about something enormous. Okay, it looks like a, a continent-wide or even global scale hydraulic catastrophe or, or cataclysm on, on, the, on our planet. I've heard, I've heard the term mega sequence uh, for, for these layers. Is that unique here? Well, we have the sock mega sequence here, if you will, a thousand feet of sandstone, shale, limestone that goes continent-wide. There are four other big sequence mm. packages of strata that sit above it. Those are also very continuous like this. You mean you find them also around the world? Around, around the, the world continent? and other continents, mm. and uh, that uh, general style describes what the rock layers of the earth are like. 
They've been uh, divided into big uh, packages of different types with sandstone, shale, limestone, and that makes for this big picture of the continuity of the strata, which allows us to visualize what the flood was like. And the sequence uh, where we have shale, limestone, all of these things in a, in a constant order, is there a reason for that? I think the scour, when it happens, the power of the water pulverizes the rocks and the coarser grains of sand that are milled right in the location are, are falling out first. Then the, the fine particles up above, the shale comes second because uh, the water loses velocity or gets deeper. And then the final thing are carbonate sediments of, of lime uh, uh, composition with lots of marine fossils are all around us. And so those, those strata themselves get uh, processed last. And, and so a sequence is, sequence is deposited in that fashion. So that would argue for a, a, uh, uh, a flood or something that was going on at the same time all of those were laid down rather than each layer laid down over a long period of time. Yeah, I think, yes, they, they're laid down uh, over a surface in sequence as the, as the flood migrates. Mm -hmm. So, but if you have a, a thicker material uh, in, a, in a large sequence, you would expect it to lay out the way, way it is. Yes. But it means that that whole sequence was flowing through at the same time. It does, so the packages argue for continuity and, and colossal scale. Steve, the, the material that's laid down on top of this granite, uh, describe it to me. Where did, where did it come from? Well, mostly it's quartz and feldspar grains. And the quartz and feldspar grains are like what is in the granite below. What was ground up from the what granite? What was ground up from the granite. So the milling of the granite could produce the major grains in the Tapete sandstone overlying this great unconformity. But the, the minor minerals, what we call heavy minerals, the, these minerals, uh, some of them, the heavy minerals, are different and uh, don't occur in the granite underneath. So they must have come from somewhere else. They come else. from somewhere else. And that brings a big mystery. Not every mineral in the Tapit sandstone can come from a local source. And so there must be a distant source of sand grains. And some of these dark black heavy uh, grains have been found in the Great Lakes region and over in the Appalachian region. And so maybe that's the direction from which the major quantities of this sand came. I mean, that's almost mind blowing to, to think. The, the power we're talking about here, it, not just to crumble this granite, but then to transport it from the Great Lakes. So we're talking about a huge flow of water and must have been traveling very quickly. So we need a conveyor belt, essentially, to move sediment from one location to another. And I love thinking about mud flows and that, that kind of thing being the, the way that big masses of sediment move long distance. Mm -hmm. Uh, mud flows are kind of your specialty, aren't they? Well, I like mud flows, and, <laughs> and uh, they appear frequently in the rock strata, and I love pointing them out when I and, see them. And when you see mud flows, are, are you seeing the same kind of thing, that they extend over a large, large area? Yes, and uh, well, some of the ba base of the Tapit sandstone here is muddy kind of composition, mm -hmm. and it's very widespread. Yeah, um, mud flows can go hundreds of miles underwater mud flows. Mm -hmm. And we think of mud flows as rather, uh, what would you say? Um, th thin and narrow and going down valleys or something like that, but they can be under the ocean, be very widespread. And maybe over thousands of square miles, they can move hundreds of miles. It's, in it's almost like there was an ocean of mud uh, underneath there flowing. Yes. That's how big yes. you're talking about. So when you pulverizing granite rock, you you creating massive amounts of, of of particles that can be in a slurry that can flow great distance. I would think most people would think of a mud flow as something that's moving fairly slowly. Is that how you see it? Um, yeah, a lot of people talk about debris flows and mud flows as being rather slow things. Mm -hmm. The ones I have had experience with in the field 
uh, I would not be of that character. You want to watch out for them. Is that okay. Mount St. Helens, yeah, for example? Mount St. Helens, for example. I do field work out there, and I have to watch out for mud flows because uh, they're, they're rather severe, and just one or two feet of mud uh, can uh, ruin your whole day. You avoid those kind of things. But so mud how... flows are very fast moving when we see them in uh, their, their general character. So how fast do you think a mud flow uh, would be flowing on, on the bottom of the ocean? Uh, we can actually calculate it. Uh, we can calculate what the what the the velocity would be to make a mud flow mo move suspended in water. An underwater mud flow generates a dynamic pressure at its head, and that dynamic pressure, the pr you know, like putting your hand out of the window when you're in the car, that pressure has to be equal to the submerged weight of the mud. And when that forward moving pressure is equal to the weight of the submerged mud that creates uh, a, an effect called a hydroplane. And once you get a hydroplane, the, the, it becomes frictionless, essentially, and it can move great distance. That's like we worry about on a highway. Yes. Uh, about a water, car or water. water getting under a tire can create a hydroplane. Mm -hmm. Water getting under a mud flow creates a, a non-stick, uh, frictionless surface. So that, that means it can really, it can scoot become. along. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep, and mud flows can transform very abruptly and deposit quickly once they get frictional. But mud flows, when they, uh, when they become in a frictional condition, mm -hmm. can either explode in turbulence and be deposited or just become frictional and freeze. So is that how, that's how we can get material from the other side of the continent all the way to here before it finally settles? Yeah. Uh, they're very effective at moving things. So I, I believe that that type of sedimentary process is the conveyor belt, the main conveyor belt during the global flood. Mm -hmm. um, high concentration slurries moving on level surfaces like mud flows with hydroplane underneath. Um, at 20 or 30 miles per hour is a good speed for an underwater mud flow on a level surface. And, uh, and they, they, can move, uh, they can move hundreds, maybe even thousands of miles. That's pretty scary. Yeah, and they, we even believe we have that kind of mud flows on the ocean floor today. Even today. Even today, but th they occur where we can't mm -hmm. see them very easily. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, this is probably the major sediment movement process today. Steve, is it just mud flows that's going on though? Are there other forces that are involved? Mud flows are very high concentration slurries that that uh, move with gravity essentially, and they move on very low surfaces. But there's another effect in the global flood situation, and that's currents. Water currents themselves are able to suspend and disperse sediment and move in a sweeping action over a surface. And that uh, current action creates some of the interesting layers in the canyon here, like right here in the Tapete Sandstone. So this would be more of a current we're talking about, not a mud flow. Oh uh, yeah, mainly current. The bottom probably is a mud flow and then the currents uh, take over and these currents probably are sweeping in one direction. The main current direction uh, in the bottom is off the continent. The water, is go uh, the water at the bottom is going uh, to the southwest, okay. okay, off the main part of the continent. And, uh, but water above may be coming onto the continent from the, uh, the ancient ocean over there. And so the, this creates a kind of an underwater uh, uh, undertow, if you will. Mm -hmm. And this, the sweeping action of the undertow is milling and suspending the particles. And then they, uh, they're falling out as the grains create the sandy beds and later get cemented to make yeah. sandstone. The conventional story is entirely different, though. It would say that there is a lot of time between each of these layers. Is that what we see? Yeah, well, as we look at this, we see the granite, and it's not weathered granite. Mm -hmm. It's not uh, turned to clay, severely altered. I don't see a soil horizon there. I see mechanical weathering or, or mechanical pulverization of rock, but I don't see the chemical residue of millions of years. Some people have said that the great unconformity boundary here represents half a billion years. You mean between, between the granite we see in that first layer of the sedimentary rock? Yeah, they say that there may be half a billion years there. Okay, and that's what their explanation of uh, Earth history would ask them to consider. 
yet when you come here and look at this, I don't see the, the channeling or uh, the uneven surface. I don't see a soil horizon. I don't see the, the actual mineral residue from chemical weathering. I see the mechanical process. And so I, I feel confident that sedimentary process and the power of water can uh, transform this surface in a rapid way. We don't need millions, hundreds of millions, even half a billion years here. And so time is not a magic wand that's the hero of the plot. Uh, time is foreign to a good explanation here. And so we want to explain what we see. And uh, that's what we see here. Well, Steve, the picture that we're painting here is that we're looking at a level that the conventional story says was exposed uh, to the atmosphere and everything else for a long, long period of time. But most people, when we see the surface of the Earth, I mean, it is really rugged. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is carved out. There are peaks, there are valleys, there is crumbling rock. And what you're saying is that is not what we see here. It's nearly a featureless plane. Uh -huh. It's not an exactly a plane, but it's a, it's a gently rolling surface. Mm -hmm. And would that be the product of billions of years? Or would that be the product of the power of water planing off a surface? And it seems like that evidence alone would cause one to say, no, that this, this boundary happened uh, quickly. Yes. The layer above and, and the shearing off. And we're looking at three things. We're looking at a package of granite, a three-dimensional body. We're looking at the Tapete sandstone above, which is a three-dimensional body of sand, particles which have been cemented. And then we're looking at the two-dimensional surface, the boundary between, which is really nothing. And we're thinking about how the two come together here. Yeah, it's just and a plane. It's a plane. And so it, it's, it brings our minds to grapple with this origins question almost immediately. Everybody who marvels at rocks in the earth must come here and uh, must imagine the history that's here. And it's a compelling thing to come and look for history in rocks. And the power of water in rocks right here in the bottom of Grand Canyon is like nowhere else. That's for sure.